Good morning, good morning, good morning. Check, check. Good morning. Welcome to the Arts, Media, and Entertainment Leadership Institute for 2019. I, this is our fifth year. We're very excited about that, our fifth year here in San Diego. And this is your conference. 
Uh, it started five years ago when Chris McClung and I had been going to Educating for Careers for about four years and watched AME folks wander around that conference looking for something for them, for professional development. And we decided that what we needed to do is really provide something for you all. And so this conference started. If some, anyone was here at that first conference back at the, uh, great, back at the um, town and country? Okay, and so we have grown steadily every year, and this year I think we have a great conference in store for you. I'm Jack Mitchell. I work at the California Department of Education. I represent you all. I'm the arts, media, and entertainment industry sector lead. And um, thank you. And like most of you, I was a classroom teacher for 22 years in Los Angeles. I taught theater and stagecraft. I have AME credential. I worked in the film and television in industry for a couple of years after I graduated from CalArts. And it's been my pleasure to serve you in California in, at the Department of Ed for the last 10 years. Uh, this is a complicated conference to put on. You can see we have some great uh, sponsors and some great vendors outside. And none of that could be done without the help of Chris McClung. So I'd like a big round of applause for Chris McClung. She'll, she will be up and speak to you later. But we really couldn't get this done at all without support at the Department of Ed Education. And if you've been around a while, you may have heard me say some things that might be considered disparaging about the Department of Education. It's a huge bureaucracy, and if you work in a large district, you know that bureaucracies can be very difficult to navigate. And a lot of folks at the Department of Education don't really understand the arts, period. They don't understand how what you do helps students learn in all content areas. And so that's sort of been my challenge. But it hasn't been a challenge with the person that I'm about to bring up. He is my manager at the Department of Education, and he has supported me and all of you from the very beginning. He fights, and it is a fight sometimes, with the folks at the, on the division level, at the folks on the branch level, to be sure that we're able to provide you with the things that you need to do your job as, at the best of your ability. And so I would like to bring up to start this conference off um, my manager, Pete Callis. Thanks, Jack. Good morning. I'm here to welcome you on behalf of the California Department of Education. Uh, I was a high school principal for close to 20 years, middle school and high school principal, um, totally supportive of the arts. Every time we got into a budget crisis, one of the programs I made sure I saved was arts and music. Um, that kept my students in class, that kept the students going. And then when I got to the department, I started in charter schools. For some reason, that's where you start when you get to the department. Um, and you kind of feed your way through the system. As Jack said, it's a huge bureaucracy, and we're always battling, um, dealing with, um, whoops. I promise I have a PowerPoint. So anyway, I was trying to figure out my whole link to arts, media, and entertainment, and the first couple slides talk about this. How many of you guys know what the college career indicator is all about? Have you guys been to some trainings about it? Good. So one of my responsibilities with um, our division is I'm responsible for the college career indicator. So we always get vendors calling us saying, hey, I've got this great idea. If you put this on the college career indicator, it's really gonna get the kids to that um, proficient level that they're career ready. So one of the things that we got, and Jack and I were talking about this, <laughs> right, Jack? Yeah. So I, I'm not gonna say who the vendor is or, or what, but it was three questions. And those three questions you answer is gonna tell you what career path you should follow, right? 
So me being curious and really wanting to go, hmm, did I make the right decision on my career path, right? And so I go, I'm going to do this. So this is my link to AME. So the first question was, pick your favorite color. I don't remember what I picked. And then question number two, pick your next favorite color. Now the final question, pick your least favorite color of these three, right? And then you hit enter, and it gives you what career you should go into. <laughs> Results. TV movie actor, stage actor, screenwriter. These were my results. And I was like, Jack, I figured it out. My link to you is this, right? First of all, I hated talking in front of people before I became a teacher. Um, so then my career path, what did I want to be? I wanted to be a professional baseball player like every kid. Didn't speak English when I started school. Um, so I had to learn how to speak English. I had to learn how to read, all of that. So how many of you have seen Big Fat Greek Wedding? That's my life, okay? <laughs> Big Fat Greek Wedding. Um, and then I also wanted to be an architect or an engineer. So when I went to college... Guess what? I went to college on a baseball scholarship. So I got to play professional baseball. So I achieved that goal. Um, got hurt after four seasons in professional baseball. So then it was like, now I got to finish my degree. So what do I do? Okay. It's too late to be an engineer or architect because those classes went by as I was going through baseball in college. So that was a tough one. So I became a teacher. I became a coach, principal. And then at one point, I got recruited to the private sector. I went to Hewlett Packard, and I was a human resource manager, which is a great experience for this role that I'm in right now because I got to work in the field for a few years to see what it was like, to see what the field was looking for in, teach, in students coming out and um, looking for those soft skills. And at Hewlett Packard, the most important thing, other than you know, hiring engineers and bringing them in, was the soft skills part, right? So that's one of the things that we look at when we help develop our students. And now, Department of Education, that move was made because nine years ago, we had twins. And so I was done being a high school principal because I was gone every night and I needed to spend time with my family. Um, so the biggest thing I look for when I'm looking to hire staff or teachers is looking for that passion. Not that book smarts, but that passion. That deep burning desire that I felt when I was an athlete, and looking for that in teachers and staff. When we do interviews, um, I can attest one of our interviewees and, and Cindy Rose, who works for me, we finished an interview and Cindy walked her to the elevator and the person, <laughs> she's laughing, the person we interviewed said, who is that guy at the end of the table look like he's ready to fall asleep? And it was me, because the interview was so bad that I was done in the first five minutes because there was no passion at all coming from this person, and that's what I want. I mean, like Jack, he's out in the field, he's working with you, he's supporting you. I mean, that's our goal is to make sure that we get you all the resources. And part of me here, being here today is the political side, and never thought I'd be in, the, in politics, but I'm right in the middle of it with this position. Um, Degrees of separation. Then, my other link to Jack was his brother. Um, I, do you, I, many of you know Clay Mitchell with Skills USA and working in our department. So, in 1984, kind of dates me back, but um, I was at Cal State Northridge. We won the College World Series that year for Division II. Jack's brother, Clay, was a trainer at Cal State Fullerton. They won the Division I World Series. When I signed my first contract, I had players from Clay's team on my team, my first year, second year in the minor leagues. And so we've known each other in one way or another through that degrees of separation, right? So that's my other link to, to Jack. So, and we talk about sports all the time. We talk about our programs all the time. So just having that passion and feeling it is what makes it, it keeps me going constantly every day. Because going and sitting in a cubicle 
is not like being on a campus and being around students, which I truly miss. So this is my political side. There's some bills that we need support on. Um, this one's just an interesting one that, that I had to review recently. We're, somebody in the legislature decided that we need to change the label of students that are at risk to at promise, which means we had to change all of ed code and go through and, and anywhere there's students of at risk, we have to change it to at promise. I thought this was an interesting one. I just share this when I'm doing presentations. This is another one that is in our office, which is Assembly Bill 198. How many of you use our, our CalCurrent, our Cal, California Career Resource Network? I mean, it's free. We have over a million users a year. Average use is 16 minutes, which is big for a hit on a website. And we have a lot of schools using ones that they're paying for. This one's free. This bill, when it first rolled out, um, Assembly Member Quirk Silva wanted to actually have an aptitude test linked to this that every high school student would take, which would be great, because then we'd look at soft skills, we'd look at career readiness with this aptitude test. The problem was, once we gave her the bill for how much it was gonna cost to put it together, and the annual cost, just putting this test together was $3 million to do statewide. So they kind of backed off on the test, but they are supporting the use of CalKern. Um, AB 1233, another really good bill that we got hurt three years ago because we were paying for AP and IB exams through um, some federal funds that we were getting. So our at-risk students, our free and reduced lunch students, were only having to pay $5 for an AP exam. So that means that we gave them those opportunities, you know, and that chance to get some college credits. That went away. Through LCFF, it came back through the district-funded um, federal programs, and it was a district's option whether to continue this program or not. So if you can support this bill also, that would be great. And then again, this, the last one is AB 1303, which is the CT incentive grant. That impacts your programs directly. Um, there, we're looking at getting $450 million a year for CTE programs. So, your support on this one, if you're talking to anybody about it, anybody in the legislature, please support this bill. Get them to support it. Um, we're hoping, of the 450, we're hoping to at least get 300 million a year ongoing funds, which will really take care of your programs. That's all I have. I want to say, have a great conference. This, I was here the first year we started this conference at Town & Country. Um, it's grown, it's almost, tripled in size, um, continue supporting Jack, continue being supportive of our students out there, and remember, be passionate and give them those opportunities to move forward. Thank you. Yes, we, that 1303, we really need your support because how many of you have taken advantage of CTE incentive funding? Uh, great, yeah, it's a great opportunity, and some of the folks that you see outside who are, the, who are vendors here, uh, you can use those CTIG funds, this, the, the 1303 funds, to access the, their equipment or their program, and so I, we, you really need to support that. Uh, one of the things that has been missing from arts, media, and entertainment for a long time is an opportunity to share what we do. Um, and so this year, with the help of Johanna Morrow, uh, we put together a flyer, and each of you have a fly got a flyer when you came in that gives you some background information. I know that when I was in the classroom, the biggest challenge I had was helping counselors understand what my program did. I had, well, the counselors would come in two or three times a semester, grab a student, take him out of my stagecraft class, and say, this kid is college bound, there's no reason for him to be in this class. And so we put together this flyer that has information about our pathways. You can see it shows that we have 218,000 students statewide, the largest industry sector in the state, by over 100,000 students. Uh, it has information about our pathways, and I would bet that most of your counselors are not familiar with the pathways in arts, media, and entertainment. It has information about the economy, and this is a huge piece. Because when I started, I was told that uh, there are no jobs for arts students. 
there's no way that they're going to work afterwards, and that the, the arts are talent-based pursuits, that either you have talent or you don't. And so one of the things we wanted to, sp to do was dispel that myth that there were no jobs, that the arts were not part of the California economy. And as you can see from the data up there, they're a huge part. Uh, I also wanted to highlight the AME demonstration sites, because raise your hand if you're from an AME demonstration site. Okay, these are the fo folks who support m me around the state. There's only one consultant for arts, media, and entertainment for the 218,000 kids, and I'm based in Sacramento. And so these folks are like outstationed uh, AME support technical support people and so they'll be talk you'll be hearing from them in the um, the second breakout session this morning uh, next I would like to bring up to the stage the reason we're all here we have some students who are going to perform for you and I would like to introduce their vice principal from the San Diego School of Creating Creative and Performing Arts Richard Trujillo Thank you, Jack. Um, just a correction, I'm not a vice principal. I, I wish I was a vice principal. Um, so let me just tell you real quick what it is that I do. As artistic director at the San Diego School of Creative and Performing Arts, I have the incredible joy of overseeing 22 certificated arts teachers in five different majors, representing 11 different programs of study. The uh, School of Creative and Performing Arts is in our 40th year. We are celebrating 40 years this year. Um, and we are a school that is ranked currently in the top 20 in public art schools in the United States. And we are very proud of the work that we do. Thank you. You have to audition to get into the San Diego School of Creative and Performing Arts. Um, and once you do, Students are on a pathway of getting themselves ready to be audition ready or portfolio ready for the post-secondary. We have two goals for every student that comes to SCPA. To graduate as a sophisticated, literate world thinker who is audition ready or portfolio ready for the post-secondary. Uh, and so without further ado, we're gonna share with you a little bit about what we do at SCPA. We're gonna feature our dance department this morning. Um, I want to recognize the chair of the dance department, Miss Annette Barcelona, who is right there against the wall. Annette and her faculty um, colleagues, there's five of them in the department, they do an amazing job with these young students. We say at SCPA that we live, live your passion, and these students that you're about to see do just that. Um, our spring dance concert, some of you have a flyer on your table, some of you don't. Our spring dance concert is coming up in the next two weeks at SCPA. We encourage you to come out and watch it. We bring in choreographers from around the country and around the globe to set original work on our students. And this morning, you're going to see a piece from international uh, choreographer Alex Ketley. Um, Alex came and spent eight days uh, at our school site working with the students directly, auditioning them, casting them, and then uh, following through with his original piece of choreography. So this morning, that's what you're gonna get a chance to see. So I wanna invite our amazing students up to uh, share their passion, their craft, and their art with you this morning. Thank you all for, uh, for allowing us to be here. Jack and Chris, thank you so much.
Regardez, il y a des œufs, du lait, de la famille, du beurre et bien sûr du chocolat. If you're tired and feeling so lonely You wake up at night Thinking that only If you had somebody Will I be somebody Be somebody to Say there were plenty of fish in the sea, but you're out in the cold and you're feeling empty, looking for somebody. Will I be somebody? Somebody. Just beautiful. Let's have another round of applause for the dancers from San Diego School of Creative and Performing Arts. Working at the Department of Ed, I get very few chances to see students, so it's wonderful for me to get to, you guys see students all the time, but for me this is really a special treat. Um, this conference couldn't happen without the support of our sponsors. And we are very lucky to have built some amazing sponsors over the years, and they're people that support you. They're people whose, whose products and whose uh, 
software and stuff support you and help you do your job better. Uh, and so this year's sponsors for the conference are Toonboom. How many of you use Toonboom products in your classroom? All of you animators? Um, Wacom, and Wacom has been our, a sponsor for us for the last three years, and we really appreciate their support. They're going to be supporting the, um, the reception that we have this evening, and so as you have that drink on them, you'll want to remember Wacom. Um, USITT is an organization that we just connected with last year. Are any of you members of USITT? Raise your hand if you're a member of USITT. Okay, USITT is a, uh, an organization for theater professionals and live performance professionals. And I'll talk a little bit more about them when I introduce their uh, executive director to come and speak to you. Um, Certiport uh, is offering free cert testing for uh, Adobe products. How many of you took advantage of the Certiport lab last year? Anybody get their certification last year? Okay, they are here again this year, and so if you're interested in certification, they will be providing that for free. And if you're not ready to take the test, they will give you a voucher, they'll give you test prep information, and you can take it for free on your own time. And so they're a huge supporter of us. And the first person I would like to bring up is a person who represents a longtime sponsor of ours and somebody who you guys work with all the time. Um, Adobe has been steadfast in supporting this conference and supporting you as AME teachers, and we're going to open with a little trailer for them, and then I'll bring up Rosie Capron to talk to you a little bit about Adobe. The way we see it, creativity lives not only in the idea, but also in the ways you find to express that idea. Because a good idea deserves to be shared with the world in whichever media will make the most impact. Whether it's a video, a website, posters, flyers, t-shirts, an app, a social media campaign. Whatever it takes to prove your point, get people on board, get people to say, let's make it. Get your foot in the door. We believe that when students learn to express themselves in any medium, they'll find their voice. They'll find new ways to make an impact in school and beyond. They'll be the ones with the answers for, how do we make this work better? How do we make it stronger? How do we make it simpler? The students of today are the ones with the new ideas for whatever challenges come next. So let's give them a chance to create a better world. Good morning. Good morning, everyone. Um, I'm Rosie Capron from Adobe, and I am beyond thrilled um, and honored to be here um, representing Adobe. Uh, it is such a privilege to be in a room with so many just incredible, creative, caring, forward-thinking people who are doing so much to support and improve the daily lives and future prospects of our youth. So thank you for taking time out of your busy lives to be here, to uh, share your wisdom and expertise and enthusiasm, uh, not just with each other, but with industry partners as well. I'm uh, grateful for the opportunity to be here and to learn from you. I'm here to listen, to hear what's going on in your classroom, hear what your students are into, hear what do you need in order to feel more successful in your work. My uh, team at Adobe focuses on programs and resources for educators, so curriculum, certification, professional development, uh, professional communities. So um, it's just an especially exciting opportunity to uh, share that with you. Um, this is uh, <laughs> uh, certainly um, my favorite event of the year, um, the opportunity to pick your brains. Um, 
I hope that you take a moment uh, to come and introduce yourself uh, at our table in one of our sessions. The um, mission for my team is to inspire and empower the next generation to be lifelong creators. And so I would love to hear what that means to you. What do you need in order to fulfill that mission in your own work and what should we be doing to really move the ball forward? So I also want to say thank you for being here and thank you to the organizers. Thank you to Jack and Chris and the whole team. Um, we actually kicked things off yesterday with uh, an advisory meeting and I'm just blown away. It is, you guys set the standard for what it means for a state or a country to invest in their creative economy, to invest in their teachers, and to really connect education in an industry, to bring us together for challenging and productive conversations about how we really change the paths and the opportunities that are available to our students. So thank you again. Um, and thank you all for the work that you do. Um, so lastly, I'm actually going to pass it off to a dear friend and colleague, uh, David Watkins from Certiport, who's our partner for the Adobe Certified Associate Program. How many of you have already signed up or are intending to take your certification while you're here? Ooh, yay. That's super exciting. Um, and they are just fabulous partners. Um, so yeah, David, come on up. Good morning, everyone. Pleasure to be with you this morning. What a fantastic start to a, a great conference. My name is David Watkins, and I have the pleasure of uh, managing our portfolio of certification pro products, learning products, and practice tests at Certiport. The first thing I'd like to say is thank you for being here. Thank you for the work that you do. You are indeed on the front lines of ensuring that this next generation is equipped with the tools and the skill set necessary to, to confront that 21st century need. So thank you for your work on that. I love technology. I was back there just a moment ago uh, videotaping, actually, that great dancing group, the San Diego School of Creative and Performing Arts. And I, I did just a quick little 30-minute, uh, excuse me, 30-second video clip, sent it to my wife, and uh, she was by the side of my little five-year-old girl who also loves to dance. And her reply to me via text was, wow, that's totes awesome. <laughs> so that was very fantastic. Thanks for, for that great opener. Just wanted to welcome you, invite you to join us uh, over the course of the next couple of days. We're going to be doing some wonderful things, one of which includes a free certification lab uh, for you educators who would like to become certified in these important skills. Please join us in room 202 upstairs. Uh, we have a number of different uh, times where you can come and join us from 10, 1.45, 3.30 today, and then tomorrow from 9.30 to 12.45. And then in addition, later this afternoon, we're going to be hosting a, a certification uh, kind of training, a presentation that's titled Having Certification Success in the Classroom with Adobe, Autodesk, and Unity. So please join us for that. Uh, and during that hour and a half session, we'll be sharing a lot of tips and tricks on how to be effective in the classroom. And we'll look forward to that. And also, as was mentioned earlier, we do have some free resources that we'd love to provide to you, some learning content that's complimentary, as well as practice tests. So if you can get certified while here, fantastic. If not, we'd love to send you back home with all the, the resources that you need. Milton Glasser, is anyone familiar with this particular graphic artist? Has anyone heard his name? Fantastic. Before. Many of you perhaps have bought one of the t-shirts that has his logo on it. He is the individual responsible for designing the logo that says, I heart New York. And he said, there are three responses to a piece of design. Yes, no, and wow. It is my belief that through certification, we properly prepare students to wow others. Thank you for the work that you do. We look forward to having great conversations with you and have a wonderful conference. Thanks. Thank you very much, and thank you to all our sponsors. You'll be hearing from each of them as the conference progresses. I'd now like to bring up somebody who is uh, really exciting, and it's a new friend of mine. Uh, in the spring of last year, I got a call from the state superintendent, Tom Torlickson at the time, 
And uh, those of you who, well, Pete knows, if you work in our building, the superintendent doesn't talk to call consultants. There's a whole chain of command that you have to go through before you can speak to the superintendent. But the superintendent called me and said, Jack, I have a meeting with someone who is very important in the arts. And I want to be sure that there is someone there who knows something about the arts. And so could you accompany me to this meeting? And so I asked who the person was, and they said it was, it was a woman named Nadine Levitt. And she had a program that was a really exciting program that he wanted us to take a look at at the Department of Education. And so I did my homework, and I looked up Nadine Levitt, and I wondered, well, who is this person who is creating an app and an app for education, and why would we be meeting with her? Well, what I found was pretty astounding. Nadine Levitt is not just someone who created an app. She is an international performer. She is an opera singer. She is an attorney. She is a record producer. She is a Renaissance woman in all ways. And we are very fortunate to have her here to speak to you today. One of the things that our advisory committee talked about last year was the fact that many of our students come out of your classes very accomplished, but they don't really know how to market themselves. They don't really have an understanding of entrepreneurship. Well, the person that I'm about to invite to the stage is the consummate entrepreneur. She has turned her, her career in the arts, in law, in record, formal record production, into an award-winning application. And not only that, she inspires teachers and educators, music educators primarily, all over, the, all over the state and all over the country with the importance of music education. And so I'd like to bring to the stage right now and give you a warm welcome to Nadine Levitt. Wow, what, a, what, a, what an intro. I should have you around with me always. Thank you so much, Jack. Um, I, I have to admit, last night I had a, uh, a bit of a nightmare when I realized it was April Fool's, and, and I, thought, <laughs> I thought, oh my god, what if nobody shows up? Like, come, come, come and do this, this keynote, but I'm glad to see you all here, so thank you so much. Um, uh, it's my, how do I get my slide going? Are you guys going to? Perfect. Nope. Nope. Start at the beginning. Perfect, thank you. All right, so um, I wanted to maybe start with an activity since it's kind of early and we've been, we've been sitting for a while. Um, can everyone uh, just stand up for me? Great. Now everyone hold up one leg. Take your arms like this, go around like this. Okay, don't fall over. Now raise one hand, any hand. All right, good. Okay, we've got a, a little bit of, uh, uh, remember if it's the, le the left or the right. Here's what it means. According to researchers in the Journal of Ex uh, Experimental Psychology, if you l raise your left hand, it means you're more likely to be a creative thinker and you're gonna out-earn your right-handed contemporaries by up to about 26%. If you, raise, <laughs> if you raise your right hand, it means you're gonna have an easier life and you're gonna live longer by about nine years. <laughs> so, Here's, I want you guys to have the same, do the same thing again. Now this time though, I want you to think of the outcome that you want. Do you want to be more creative, and th uh, creative thinker? And do you want to earn more money? Or do you want to have an easier life and live longer? Now you pick your hand that you want to do, and you can't do both. <laughs> can't do both. But think of the outcome that you'd like. And it, it might feel a little weird at first, so we're going to practice it once. And then in your own time, you can keep practicing it. Um, all right, ready? One, two, three. All right, good. Perfect. Imagine, you can all sit down. Thank you. <laughs> Imagine if we did that same exercise with education. Imagine if with education, we, we thought about what outcome we wanted, true outcome, and then thought about how every, and, and backward engineer, and, and think about how every subject can support that outcome. Um, so what is the purpose of public school education? 
And I think if I asked every single person in this room, I'd probably have 100 different answers. Um, and, and so I, I, don't, I think it can fall within buckets of about 8 to 10 or, or 12, maybe-ish maybe, maybe -ish, uh, types of answers. And so recently I did just that. I asked, it was actually 110 because SurveyMonkey gave me 10 extra ones. But um, I asked 110 educators, employers, and parents what they thought the purpose of, uh, of public education was. And interestingly enough, it was overwhelming, there was, there was actually an overwhelming consensus. Of eight potential answers and an other field, which nobody filled in because maybe they're just lazy, but 42.73% um, thought that the, uh, the purpose of school is to develop critical thinking skills and learn how to uh, effectively problem solve. I thought that was really an interesting um, concept because I don't think parents normally think about that. Um, I was thrilled to see that um, the California Department of Education had a vision up on their website, so I, I pulled it up, uh, that all California students of the 21st century will attain the highest level of academic knowledge, applied learning, and performance skills. Now I want to take this last bit because really this is the goal at least for California Department of Ed, to ensure fulfilling personal lives and careers and contribute to civic and economic progress in our diverse and changing democratic society. Now, if you take that and translate it, it really means that the goal of public education is for students to attain skills necessary to live fulfilling lives. Obviously, that is your satisfying, uh, skills for satisfying personal life, uh, skills for a satisfying career, and for a fulfilling service to our community. Now, super powerful. I think that's a, 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 an amazing place to start, and I am in complete agreement that that should be the goal of public school education. However, it needs a lot more drilling down as to what those skills are. I mean, I know that there's a billion dollar industry in books being written about what, how, how to lead a, a fulfilling life and a satisfying life. So I don't think that we're necessarily going to drill down and get all those skills um, in, a, in, a, uh, in a list, uh, in an exhaustive list. But I do think, no matter what you say, that there, there has to be some soft skill in there. We, we have to have some soft skill development as part of that. There's no way that you can live a fulfilling life without any soft skills at all. Um, skills like um, emotional recognition, or impulse control, or maybe we're talking interpersonal skills, or problem solving. Um, so in this day of... Uh, where AI is coming, and recently there was a, a wonderful um, economist who, um, who talks about uh, AI as a giant gray rhino that is charging toward us. Um, and you can either think that it's not happening or, and dig your, your head into the sand, or you can uh, see that it's coming, uh, coming and adjust what, how, we, how we educate, how we um, develop our skills so that we have a workforce that isn't going to be um, out, of a, out of a job. So I think it was uh, China recently made it mandatory for everyone to learn an instrument. And it was in, within school. And I thought that was really interesting because uh, there's no way they would have done that without some kind of research behind it. And I think they're so heavily invested in AI that maybe that's why. I think when we think about the skills that AI will not be taking over, I think those sort of emotional, uh, those sort of the soft skill, the things that are creative, the things that are innovative are things that I don't think AI is going to be taking over anytime soon. So I love this comic because it's sort of, um, sorry, I wanted to share it with you, uh, because I want to make sure that within a school setting, we continue to develop those, those skills and we don't become less intelligent just because AI is there. I think that, in fact, we need, to, we need to think what those soft skills are and develop those further and become more intelligent because of artificial intelligence. Um, what if I told you that uh, any, if, I believe in a holistic education, first of all. I really believe that you can have many different uh, uh, lessons within, so I can, I can teach you technical skills and they also then develop soft skills, obviously. So, if I told you that we were going to learn this song right now, Bohemian Rhapsody, and I was going to randomly pick five of you to come and perform it in front of all of this wonderful crowd, 
How many of you just felt a pang of anxiety rush through your body? Yeah. Well, that's what your students feel every time you have them uh, have, have the, uh, present a new song for them to learn, right? Because it looks like a monster. It looks like this epic problem that they don't even know where to start. Um, but if we can say, this is just problem solving 101, like any other problem that you have in your life, whether it's business or otherwise, it, is, uh, it can be approached with the same techniques. You separate the problem into bite-sized chunks. So you, you separate it out. Uh, you allow yourself to take breaks. You work out what your timeline is. You don't compare yourself to others. And you focus on one or two levels of learning at, at a time. So it's either notation and fingering, and maybe uh, don't worry about the dynamics, don't worry about the uh, expression, don't worry about legato, staccato, or anything. Just get that first, and we can layer in the rest later. But this is, an, uh, is applicable to any kind of a problem. It, it doesn't matter. In, within, within work, it might be a problem of how do, I, how do I sell red socks to somebody who likes pink socks? It, it's, the same, it's the same kind of, it, once you have any kind of a problem that you have to solve, you have to figure out what, how to break it down. Uh, another uh, skill that you're learning with Bohemian Rhapsody, pattern recognition. You're better able to forecast. You might also go into the emotional recognition. What kinds of emotions could be reflected in that song? Uh, you might deal with impulse control because at that point uh, you, you have to stop and start and you have to be able to uh, control your impulses. Uh, if you happen to perform in a group, then there's collaboration. There might be communication. Um, there's, there's, there's a myriad of soft skills that are at play here. And the same can be said for dance. The same can be said for theater. The same can be said for, um, for whether you're on the stage or backstage, whether you're writing the script or, or anything. Any arts at all, anything within arts, media, and entertainment actually is, requires these soft skills, even when you're largely working by, your, by yourself. I do think that the soft skill development is much stronger when it's inherently collaborative which a lot of these subjects are. Not all of them, but a lot of them. Um, and so I think, I think we need to do a better job of signposting what those, what those uh, soft skills are. So that if we all start using the same signposts, then everybody starts to understand, oh, this is applicable in, 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 in any problem solving. Or this is, I can use this in math. Or I can use this in English. And what's interesting is, in a school setting, I don't learn math to be a mathematician. I don't learn science to be a scientist. No, these are, these are basic fundamental skills that I need to learn because I use them in my daily life. I need to know whether I, a $20 bill is going to be enough for my venti latte and a croissant, right? Um, I'm not going to whip out my calculator. Um, I need to be able to do that in my head. Or I need to uh, understand the basics of gravity. Um, there, there are fundamental things that that you, that you need to learn. However, for some reason, in, in, within arts, it's the opposite. You're supposed to only learn dance if you want to be a dancer, or music if you're going to be a musician. Why? That's ridiculous. Uh, the, the studies have been out there forever that show uh, kids who learn an instrument have, or, or dance, by the way, same thing, greater pattern, uh, pattern recognition. With patterns, you, you're so much better able to uh, forecast what someone's going to do. You're going to be a, a better judge of, of what, uh, what the likely outcome is, and you're better able to uh, remember for next time and learn from that behavior. So I talked about a holistic approach to education. What exactly does that mean? It really means that nothing should be in a silo. And when STEM happened, um, I mean, I think that the, the, the structure of, of STEAM is actually a good structure in terms of science, technology, engineering, and math. Arts, unfortunately, I think was really slotted in as an afterthought. I don't think it was ever, it was STEM and then it wasn't working, so they went, oh, hang on, who's going to design the fabulous things that you know, Apple needs to you know, sell? Or who's going to understand what a consumer is going to feel when they touch this object, right? You need design, you need art, you need uh, all these arts in order to, to uh, round out your education. Um, but unfortunately, the budget was basically gone. So there was no correct new curriculum, there was no uh, new measurements, there was no um, real research being done as to the uh, effectiveness. Um, and so it was sort of slotted back in there, and it really meant all humanities and 
um, and all art. Like art is such a broad term. So, so I think that art should be the seed and not the afterthought. So it should be the seed that ties it all together and not the afterthought. Um, we all know that in today's day and age, we don't have one job that we sit in. And, and, and it's the same job that we keep forever until we retire at 65. No, it's a long and winding road. And along the way, we pick up skills. So for me, uh, you heard some of my bio by Jack. Thank you, Jack. But, um, but I started off as a waitress right, in college. And I think it's one of the most um, wonderful ways to pick up things like staying cool under pressure, being able to collaborate with people and be, uh, work as a member of a team, being able to um, put a smile on your face even when you're having the worst possible day. It's a great way even for balancing of plates. I'm still to this day can carry a plate, very, uh, multiple plates. Um, um, uh, I've been an opera, I, I am an opera singer, I still, I still do shows. All these things are continuous, right? They don't stop suddenly. Um, I've been a lawyer though, that stopped, thank God. I'm still recovering. <laughs> I, was, I, was, I was an international trade lawyer arguing about cheese and um, whether or not it should be called camembert when, uh, or whether it was a, 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 a geographical indication. One day I woke up and I was realizing that I was not saving the world in any way, shape or form and I stopped. So um, after that, uh, I still have a, a publishing company and a label um, with some artists in it. Um, I uh, am a TV producer. I had a couple of TV shows that sold. Um, I am a mom. I have a five-year-old and a seven-year-old. Uh, surprisingly, I'm a tech entrepreneur. Who knew? I'm not even very tech savvy, but here I am. Um, I, needed, I, needed, I needed Whirly, basically, and I created uh, an app for me, which it started really, uh, for lack of a better description, as karaoke on steroids. I was doing shows, I was on the road at the time, um, working with David Foster, um, and I got the chance to open a vocal health benefit for, um, uh, and I was opening for Steven Tyler. And Steven said, would you sing one of my songs but in your own opera way? And I was like, yeah, sure, no problem. <laughs> and I had to figure out how on earth I was gonna do that. Um, and so I went online and I tried to find a backing track. Um, and I, I just used a karaoke backing track at first. But what I found was it was really hard to make that my own. It was extremely hard not to hear his iconic version in my head. And so it, start, it was just cheesy. It was just really not authentic and not cool in any way, shape, or form. So I uh, would record myself playing the piano because I'm a terrible multitasker. I can't actually do the same two things at once. Um, and I, played, I recorded myself on the piano, and, and that didn't work so well. So I ended up. Um, having to re-record it multiple times in different keys. And then I ended up hiring a pianist to play with me just so that I could um, uh, play around and, and be creative with it. And I thought to myself, wouldn't it be nice if there was an app that just let me take a song and maybe I could have an acoustic version of that song and maybe I could change the key or the speed. Like if music is about self-expression, why do I need to tailor myself to a song rather than the song tailor itself to me? Um, and that's how Whirly was born. Um, uh, and then uh, from there, I, I've, I've been on the board of Little Kids Rock, on the national board of Little Kids Rock, which is a, a wonderful organization that brings modern band training um, and instruments to uh, almost a million kids now. Um, and uh, I also sit on the advisory board for the Harmony Project, um, uh, which is a wonderful um, uh, mentor program uh, with an orchestra. Um, and I sit on the advisory board for the education um, uh, part of the Eli Broad um, stage in, in Santa Monica. Um, so I don't know what is next, uh, next for me necessarily. I, I know that Worldly, which started as this consumer app, turned into an education app because I fell so far down that rabbit hole. I realized that there was such a huge hole that we needed to be able to inspire kids and give kids um, the access and the tools to be able to express themselves both inside the classroom and at home. And so I wanted, my dream was to create a platform where lots of content providers, lots of, lots of teachers can upload their, their lesson plans and share them with each other and create communities because what I noticed was that arts teachers are often on an island all by themselves and there's usually, well there's often uh, only one music teacher um, in, in the school. 
And, and I really think um, as soon as you get isolation, it's a very, very dangerous sort of place to be because I think then the, the, the you feel unsupported. So I wonder whether we could run schools a little bit like a tech company. Now just hear me out, I know it's kind of weird, but in, uh, in the tech world we have something that's called a daily stand-up. So a daily stand-up is literally a meeting where everyone stands up, you're not allowed to sit down because you're supposed to keep it short and sweet, um, uh, and you talk about what it is that you're working on as a team. Everybody listens to it. Now imagine if instead of a daily stand-up, we could at least start with a weekly stand-up where every teacher in that, in that school could stand in a room and talk about what they're working on with their kids at different levels. Um, and then I'd ask that they go around one more time. And the second time, I want them to identify one other curriculum or one other teacher that they can support. How can English support music? How can music support science? How can dance support PE or, or whatever else? And, and you pick one other thing that you can support. And I think that's how you obliterate silos and it doesn't have to cost any money. And it, it makes a much, much uh, uh, a deeper relationship between all of the teachers. You start to feel like a team and you're working together rather than against each other. Um, so if there's any principals in here who want to take any piece of this, and if anyone does apply this, please tell me because I want to hear how it goes. I want to hear what the results are. So first, I want to show you what this looks like. Um, can I have three, um, oh, it's actually two volunteers. Okay, one, two, perfect, yep. And some of you have seen me walking around with a basketball. Oh, okay, who, I, yep, come on. Yep, here you go, I'm gonna give you the basketball. Here you go, try and bounce it, it's not, it's not, try and do it on a solo bit, I think, yeah. Is it okay, it's a little sort of dead up here, but. Can make it bounce, yeah? Okay, cool. So, you're an English teacher. You are gonna teach about, you're trying to get your, uh, maybe your kindergartners or your first graders into uh, learning the, the, uh, the months of the year. So January, February, March, April, May, so on and so forth, right? You are a PE teacher, and you're going to dribble the ball, right? And so, here, I'll show you it first, I'll, I'll demonstrate. Can you hold this for me for a second, please? Um, so it's January, February, March, April, May, June, July, August, September, October, November, December, right? So you're going to bounce it, you're going to say it. All right, ready? Ready? Ready. January, February, March, April, May, June, July, August, September, October, November, December. Great. Awesome. So this is what it looks like. I'm the music teacher, right? And, and maybe I even have a math teacher, right? And, and I can show you, notation-wise, how it looks. So notation-wise, this is what you're doing. They're, they're, they're actually eighth notes. So I can work with a math teacher and say, hey, guess what? Now we're doing fractions. And whether you want to show it this way around or whether you want to show it in a pie, and you can literally notate it on a pie. So you can really physically see fractions within music. So these are the types of tie-ins so I wanted to um, demonstrate, uh, maybe you guys can all together with, um, what's your Patricia. name? With Trisha? Patricia. But with Patricia, everyone um, clap along, singing January, February, March, April, May, blah, 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 and you will, um, it will chant or whatever. Um, and I want, uh, you can keep repeating, and I want, you sh I want to show you how we're actually making music. All right? Do you need a basketball? Too? No, you're going to do it, yeah. Okay. Ready? You're my bass drum. All right, yep. <laughs> turn uh, 
an exercise into a fun, um, fun interactive experience that the kids remember, right? And it's project-based in the sense that you're kind of working together, but it's one class. It's one class. And I can tell you, I've been in, I've been, thank you guys, by the way. Um, I've been, I've been in classrooms, and I remember, I'll never forget, I was um, uh, in a classroom in the Bronx, um, and I've sat in a lot of classrooms, probably about 400 classrooms in the last three years. Uh, I told you I went way down that rabbit hole. Um, uh, and uh, I remember there were these, these kids who were learning the 12 Bar Blues, um, and, and they weren't super excited about it, I'm just going to say, they were on their guitars. And then uh, one kid sort of started rapping a little bit over it. And the teacher, for whatever reason, decided to not let this kid rap. And I said, no, 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 can I just try something? Um, uh, and I said, I said okay, I, I just want to see if we can do, combine rap, opera, and the 12 Bar Blues. And the kids were kind of, they saw that the, the, the teacher was like, I don't know what's happening here, so I'm just going <laughs> to let you do this. Um, and, um, but she, she let me, she let me, you know, try and the kid was super excited and all the kids were sort of apprehensive, like waiting to see what would happen. And I started singing opera with him rapping and this one particular girl, I mean, her eyes were just almost popping out of her head. She was like, ah, oh my God, like that's amazing. And two years later, I saw her again and she remembered me and she said, you're that girl, you're the girl that sang opera in my classroom. <laughs> and, um, and, and I think that's the, those are the experiences that we want to fill schools with, right? Those are the experiences that create memories for people. And those are the things like a block of wood. If life is like a block of wood and, and there are little pieces being carved out of it throughout life, school is responsible for a lot of these carvings, right? But at the end of it, we have this cup with which to hold joy. So I think we need to fill we need to fill the experience of school. It's such a long period of time. It's such a huge part of your life that we, we need to make sure that arts is a huge, huge part of that um, because those are the experiences that people take away with them. All right? Thank you so much for having me, and thank you, Jack, and the team. Thank you, Chris.
performing arts, stage, de screen, mu music, dance, and theater, uh, behind the scenes, the crafts, and uh, music production and recording. So I'd like to thank you all once again and hope that you have a great day. This is the end of our morning session. So go out, stop by, talk to our vendors out in the hallway, and the sessions will begin at 10 o'clock. Thank you.